Uh, and first of all, thank you very much for having me here um, to talk as your final speaker for this series. Um, really appreciate um, the guys organising this and having you on. Um, today I want to talk to you about a project that I was involved with, which was um, the design entry uh, for the Arboretum competition. Um, it was actually the International Arboretum and Gardens competition for Canberra. Um, this was a, a very a unique opportunity. Uh, it was a project that, or a competition that was run over 10 years ago. Uh, we were fortunate enough to win, obviously, hence I'm here talking to you today. Uh, and I wanted to talk to you about this project because it really is a once-in-a-lifetime uh, project for a landscape architect, or I think for anyone, um, for that matter. We uh, went in collaboration with an architecture practice called TZG out of Sydney, and in principle it was uh, the, uh, Peter Tonkin, um, who is an old friend of mine. Uh, we agreed, uh, after I, I worked and lived in Sydney for a while, and when I moved to Melbourne, um, a way of keeping in contact was we agreed we'd do design competitions together. We figured it's a, it's a fun way to stay in touch and, and do what we like doing. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, this project which we, we refer to as 100 Forests. Um, it's a long-term design strategy for an arboretum uh, in Australia's capital city. It was the beginning of something hopefully unique uh, in the world uh, and a different way of looking at what an arboretum is or could be. Uh, a landscape project that will certainly outlast all of us uh, and I think everyone in this room. It's, it's a project that won't probably really fully realise its potential for another 50 or 60 years. Uh, this utopian project had its genesis in a real tragedy in, 2000, in the 2003 fires that devastated Canberra. Um, these fires, as you remember, um, moved through Canberra and worked all the way down to the western edge of Lake Billy Griffin. And in the process of this, uh, they burnt out what was called Dairy Farmers Hill. Um, for our site, it had burnt out 300 hectares of land that was previously covered by pine plantations. Um, and what you see in this image is what we were presented with at the time of the design competition. And just to give you a sense, the, when the fires burnt through, they burnt so hot, they effectively destroyed everything on the ground, including all the organic material in the soil. So the site itself had become sterile. Um, the only thing remnant was wind blowing the seed from adjacent pine forests coming back in that was starting to regenerate. But effectively, it was, it was a scorched earth. Following the fires as a symbol of regeneration and growth, the site was earmarked as an arboretum in a way of fulfilling the Griffin's original vision for the arboretum um, of, of the site. The original Griffin plan had always proposed that the western end of the lake be surrounded by forests um, of various types, uh, in particular reference to colour, you know, black forest or blue forest. Um, and these were a mix of uh, foreign or exotic and indigenous trees. So an international competition was announced. Um, it asked for a place of, of outstanding beauty. It had high ambitions, but it left open what is an arboretum for today and what is an arboretum for the future. Traditionally, an arboretum was a place where trees were assessed, their horticultural value and suitability in development towns and cities measured. Uh, it was a way of effectively I guess bringing trees from the first world to the second world, and likewise testing trees from the second world to send back to the first world, uh, a way of exchange, a, a botanical exchange. We all felt that this project needed to reimagine what an arboretum could be for the future. Uh, what is an arboretum of the 21st century, particularly in Canberra? The 300 hectare site located on the edge of Lake Burley Griffin is characterised by its undulating topography. Um, from the top of Dairy Farmers Hill down to the lake is a change in level of around about 70 metres. Although apparently rural in its appearance, it is urban in its context, located just three kilometres from the centre of the city and from Parliament House, and also visible from Parliament House and vice versa, standing on top of the hill you can, you can see Parliament. And interestingly for, the, for, for Canberrans, this site had pretty much been locked up. Um, no one had really experienced this view or this site uh, prior to the fires. Its scale um, and its location called out for a bold and evocative idea. 
Instead of importing an idea from elsewhere, as often in the case when you look for it, the clue for us uh, was on the site itself. During a day of traversing the site, we came across, tucked away in one corner, two beautiful forests that had survived the bushfires. You can see these in this image here. The cork oaks and the cedars. The cork oaks, aligned in skewed lines with their little trunks shorn off, uh, were a re revelation to us. It was like uh, being transported back in time to Portugal. Um, to walk through this with a beautiful filtered light, the sort of quite, uh, quite strange architectural effect of the, of the stripped black trunks. But it made you realise that the power of rather than just coming to see a tree, what it would be like if you came to see a whole forest? And by contrast, entering the Himalayan cedars, only you know, 500 metres away, planted some 80 years ago, was of course a completely different experience to that of the cork oaks. This experience was distinct by its aroma of the trees, the texture, the sound of the soft needles underfoot, and the filtered light moving through the canopy. A complete different experience to that of the cork oak. With both, both of these forests gave an insight into the possible design response to this challenge, and an insight into the possible design outcome. Another way of thinking it was talking to friends and family about what they thought an arboretum was. And for most people, well, personally I love trees, but I'd be hard pushed to get one of my friends to drive all the way to Canberra to look at a tree. So the challenge was how do we make this so interesting that if you're not necessarily interested in a tree, you actually come to Canberra to spend an extra day looking at this, this facility or this new thing. And for us it got us thinking about, well, maybe it's not about seeing a tree. But it's about experiencing that tree, experiencing it in mass. So this got us thinking, what if we could create an arboretum that contained forests from all around the world? An amazing immersive experience that allowed visitors to visit every part of the world each time they arrived. Forests that amazed with their sculptural forms, forests that dazzled in springtime, forests that had a tapestry of texture and sound as one walked through. Forests that allowed us to escape and reveal the beauty of nature. So this idea of a hundred forests was born. A vast patchwork of trees draped over the undulating site. A pattern with a scale and legibility to meaningfully engage with both its urban context. A hundred forests of rare and endangered species from all around the world. Each forest sized to ensure one could enter in and be completely immersed within the experience. If if imagining allows to, to be transported elsewhere. The hundred forests enter the dialogue with its urban setting. By aligning the grid and the arrays, the gaps between the trees, um, that define the edges according to Griffin's water axis. As you can see here on the left, the uh, the green lines represent the, the bands of forests, approximately 100 metres wide, the 15 metre wide alleys in between each band of forests, and the orange line is the original um, uh, Griffiths axis for the lake. We imagined that over time this rolling patchwork would be an amazing backdrop to the lake and to the city. The individual forest stories played out within a constant ordered frame. The simplicity of the grid allows for each forest to be different, their arrangement unique. Each forest, we contended, should be rare and endangered species from around the world. A living seed bank. A genuine conservation message on an initiative that makes this place internationally relevant. The plan established a 50-year vision uh, which anticipates an increasing density of paths, gardens, terraces and cultural facilities being developed as the forests and visit, visitation grew. The, I guess the, the measure that if we could create a simple enough idea as 100 forests, this idea would be robust enough that you then could plug in whatever facilities the future may, may see demand for. Each forest is laid out in patterns 
inspired by unique forms of the trees, its buds, and their cultural stories. This forest is arranged in according to its seed. Um, the pagato tree, which is the last, last in the wild inside its extinct volcano, its forests lay out uh, repeating the, vol the volcanic form and the top topographic pattern, shown here in this sort of circular form. As for the she oak, the drooping she oak is arranged to highlight particular trees uh, within the pattern to reference how black cockatoos come back to the same tree in the, in the wild year after year. The result is a rich tapestry of forests, stories and arrangements. Ethnobotany, I guess you might call it. The forests, each different, each with their own story to tell. Each that offers a myriad of journeys and discoveries. So we've begun. 100 forests are in and 50,000 trees have begun. What this drawing just shows here is each each dot represented in white is a tree. So that is 100 forests. Um, each forest ranged between three and four hectares in size. The forest widths were about 100 metres wide. The average forest was between three and four hectares. Um, at the time of working this out, myself and uh, a colleague, Chris Johnson, we, we travelled to Canberra and we looked at as many diverse forest types that we could find in Canberra. And this might silly, sound silly, but we went with a camera, a couple of mobile phones and a tape measure. And I would stand still and Chris would walk as far as he could until I couldn't see him anymore. And then we'd measure the distance and try and determine what is the point of immersion within a forest type. For some cases it was only 8 metres, in some cases it was 80 metres. And that's how we determined the dimension of the forest. Because we wanted to make sure that we had a, a spatial condition that was big enough to take any forest type that would guarantee you once you were in the middle you'd never be able to see the edge. So this is where we are today. As I said, 100 forests are in, 50,000 trees um, have been planted. At first, all that was evident of the forests was the patterns formed by the tree surrounds, the guards. But even these were, were uh, being appreciated, particularly when they became iridescent in the evening light. Some of the early plantings um, had already given a sense of wonder um, that was awaiting. Uh, in this case, it was a sighting for an art, artwork. Whilst on the ground, a sense of immersion and discovery is now being able to be experienced. This image here, these Woolmite pines, uh, were only recently discovered in, in Western Sydney uh, and are now able to be experienced uh, for the first time as a forest in Canberra. These rare birches from Spain are beautiful trees, displaying their papery trunks on mass. Uh, and these trees are only five years old. So, um, some of them actually surprise us at how quick they grew. In this image, uh, the giant sequoias, while, while ultimately they will become one of the, the signature trees of, of the Arboretum and one of the, one of the biggest, um, they effectively leading a ride to the visitor centre designed by architects Peter Tonkin uh, and our, also our collaborative partner in the overall project. The visitor centre, this facility is located on a high point on the site following the topographic silhouette of the site and provides elevated views to Canberra. Uh, a sympathetic response effect architecturally to the, to the top of the, of, the, um, of the hill. It now provides um, a starting point for the orientation, information and interpretation of visitors arriving to the site. Adjacent to the visitor centre and forming the major arrival experience to the 100 forests is the Central Valley a large earth sculpture, some 300 metres long and 75 metres wide. Um, effectively a large cut and fill exercise. Uh, this captures water and delivers the water down to a dam that we uh, designed and had constructed. Uh, this then enables us to pump water back up to holding points around the site and irrigate or provide temporary irrigation for the establishment of the trees. This topographic form um, is more a a language topography and an amphitheatre adjoined to it that is used for, informally for passive recreation and for major concert events. The amphitheatre here. Um, 
this was a we, we created moments within the forest, um, allowing people to get into the cedar forest here, um, just a simple picnic table and barbecue facility. Um, this was the artwork, white brown land. Um, So after the visitor centre was constructed, um, the client was very keen, the client being the ACT government, was very keen to develop a playground um, to, I guess, uh, engage families with children um, and encourage uh, activity with on the site um, that they were, I guess, worried that the forest perhaps weren't just exciting enough for little kids. So, um, it was suggested that the children orientation environment, the client had said okay, uh, but basically they said whatever playground you design, it must outcompete the Xbox. That was the brief. So, using the ideas of seeds as the beginning of life for the for the, for the forest, this sort of became the iconic form of the playground. Um, children and families can enter a fantasy world um, of an exaggerated scale. A play, space, a play space made of giant acorns that float up towards the sky. Um, creating engaging children's spaces with the, with the beauty of trees and a forest of long life connections to this remarkable environment. Um, it's, we're creating a world amongst the giant seeds. Uh, aims to stimulate uh, spontaneity and creative play. Uh, to foster the imagination and to challenge and encourage uh, confidence with growth for children. When my associate Chris was there for the um, opening of the playground, he said he'd never seen a traffic jam of children trying to get on and off equipment before uh, it was that popular. Um, within all the pods, there are various things that are uh, interpretive elements that what the children might find in the forest are then brought into the playground. And 